incarnation. Um, STED, as you probably know by now, stands for Spine Technology Education, and the D is multifocal discussion, discovery, debate, discourse, whatever you want to put into there within reason, stands for D. Again, uh, we always uh, have great speakers to provoke our thoughts and select a topic of their choice and passion, and it's a great pleasure to have Dr. Victor Chang here today. I'll introduce him in greater detail later, uh, but he is um, a Vice Chair of Research at the Henry Ford Health Institution and System Spine Director there. Uh, he's been a long-term supporter here in our courses, and he's selected the topic of cages and advancements of cages later. And uh, again, a more detailed introduction will come later. Uh, today we've selected some cases that are um, hopefully appropriate for it, and uh, when Dr. Chang is on, we'll ask him for his opinions and management input. I wish you could all could be here in person because we have uh, a cool technology here to look at in our lab later, uh, the 7D instrumentation uh, visualization device, which is non-ionizing. Uh, with surface scanning by or a C-spine slash ortho, orthofix. So uh, we're all looking forward to that after the end of this presentation. And thank you for C-spine orthofix for uh, this cool opportunity. Uh, we have, I think, four cases. Is that correct, Dr. Anderson? And Dr. Anderson is our administrative chief. Four cases that we want to go through. And wearing his cool cowboy boots and having operated into the middle of the night with me last night, he looks uh, very fresh. Dr. Brian Anderson is going to take the lead with a recent case. Dr. Anderson. Good morning. Thank you very much for that introduction. All right, I'm going to present a case that uh, we have a patient that we recently took care of. Uh, this is a 76 year old female. She has a seven year history of progressive low back pain and um, pain that uh, extends into her lower extremities. And she has also has an inability to sit uh, for any period of time or to stand up straight, um, which uh, limits her ability to ambulate. No history of trauma, but she did have a fusion surgery at an outside hospital approximately eight years ago. It was an L2 to uh, L5 uh, posterior instrumentation with T lift cages at L2 3 and L4 5. She subsequently had three washouts uh, that did involve a, a durotomy and a durotomy repair. She got normal bowel bladder function. On exam, she has very prominent hardware on, uh, in her mid back. Uh, she's got decreased sensation in both legs. She has weakness both legs, hyperreflexia of the patellas, and she has a fairly normal BMI. Her medical history is significant for rheumatoid arthritis and renal disease. She does take Imuron and Plaquenil, in addition to osteopenia, which she previously took, Prolia. Here you can see her standing scoli images, AP and lateral, and then a uh, close-up lumbar lateral. Uh, demonstrates L2 to L5 instrumentation with cages at two, three, and four, five, and you can see, especially on that far right image, pull out of her proximal um, construct. So this is more like a PJF um, uh, with a proximal kyphosis at L12 scenario. Here's an MRI uh, from this patient. Um, it does show um, the fairly open canal um, but it does highlight the, that kyphosis at L2-3 again um, with significant edema at that level. And then I do have a CT showing uh, significant gas in the area of uh, L2-3 um, and what appears to be a non-unit at L2-3 with a free-floating um, cage at that level. Uh, the other cage down at L4-5 um, looks to be solid um, and without evidence of non-union. So in summary, we have an eight-year, uh, we have a 76-year-old female uh, who's eight-year status post this fusion surgery with T-lifts and unfortunate washouts, uh, who now has six years of low back pain with bilateral lower extremity numbness, weakness in her lower extremities, and after reviewing her imaging and her um, physical exam, she has uh, she really has PJF with decompensated kyphoscoliosis. She has a non-union at L23, 
uh, which uh, may likely be infected given her prior history. And she also has soft tissue compromise with her hardware protruding out the back. Usually at this time, I, I, I usually propose a couple different ways to treat the patients. Um, but in this patient, I think that there's only two, two options. Uh, you can treat her conservatively given her um, prior surgical history and her, her medical comorbidities and say that this is just not something that we can do surgery on, or I think you operate and you have to do something big. You have to take care of the um, hardware issue. You have to take care of the infection issue. You have to take care of the, um, the kyphosis. And I think this all involves a large surgery with extension up the spine and down to the pelvis. So that was an excellent summary on a difficult case. Thank you, Brian. Dr. Chang, good morning to you. Are you live? Are you unmuted? Let me see. Yeah, good morning. How are you guys? Thank you so much for joining us and uh, um, very cool topic today. And we throw you right into the melee, right? Uh, so uh, this patient has a number of years behind what was, uh, by all retrospective regards, a very traumatic period. She was in the hospital for about four months, had multiple washouts, CSF leak, yada, yada, yada. And the treating surgeon didn't see her that often, but told her this is as good as it gets. And you don't want to go through this again. And um, she basically somehow surreptitiously ended up on our doorstep, unable to sit anymore. And this is a very high functioning patient with a number of comorbidities. So uh, I don't know whether you want to have Dr. Anderson go back to one of the images like the CT mile, but should we, what went wrong? Should we venture into another surgery here? Right. Yeah. I mean, looking at the CT, um, you know, I was kind of curious, is there a spondylolysis at L5? You're awesome, Dr. Chang. Boom. For the audience, this is not uh, scripted. He, uh, we put him into a cold call. Yes, she has like a hyperextension isthmic spondylolisthesis with a grade one antrolisthesis. Very, very good. And she has an L5 root impingement. You can't see it very well, but um, the, there's a repair tissue that's kind of obstructed her L5 roots. Yeah, so I, I mean... You know, I'm always suspicious when you see a plesthesis at 5.1, you know, to verify if, if they have a spinal lysis. And unfortunately, it seems like it gets missed quite a bit. Um, and then people end up doing different operations that um, don't really uh, under, uh, address the underlying pathology. So I think, you know, when, um, you know, when you're discussing what, what to do, I think uh, it's helpful to think systematically, like breaking down, you know, the individual components of her pathology. Um, you know, I would say number one is addressing the the listhesis at five one, the spondylolysis, because um, you know I would I would imagine that's probably driving a lot of the continued leg symptoms um, that she's having. Because you know, an important question is uh, for these types of folks is the the issue that you had the surgery to begin with. Did that get better with the surgery? And I, I would guess the answer might have been no in this this individual. Um, so that's that's one thing. So that's one thing to package. And then number two is just addressing the 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 hardware the failure uh, more proximally with the pullout. Um, you know, she looks pseudoarthrosed at uh, two three there as well. And so just kind of how you know what what um, and then there's some. Uh, focal, uh, you know, the proximal failure that you, you noted there. So there's a focal kyphosis there to, to address as well. So um, I think th those two, those are probably your, your two things that you want to think about in terms of how, how you would approach this and what, what you would, um, you know, if you're going to design an operation, what you would do. And just uh, really excellent points uh, to harp on the point again, she had, three washouts. She was on antibiotics for a long time because of her immune compromise. I think about a year in retrospect. Um, and uh, it, does that factor into your practical solution? I mean, I obviously uh, pin you down on what you would do practically. Right. Yeah. All your yeah. points are good. Uh, well, I think, um, you know, my niche is minimally invasive surgery. And so, you know, uh, you know, for better or worse, infections are not, or post-operative infections are not really something we have to deal with a whole lot. So, um, you know, I think immunocompromised, chronic steroids, I mean, these are all things to think about, but when, when you're designing a minimally invasive operation for these folks, you know, that's not as much of a consideration than if, if you're going to do it open. 
I mean, I think your tissue burden um, for healing is is much less uh, in these types of surgeries. So, so I hear no answer. Or you do an MIS surgery, like a um, open anterior fusion on her, and the, some percutaneous rods and hardware removal, or uh, what would you do? Yeah. So I think, um, you know, I, yeah, there's a lot of different ways to do this. I think. You know, I, uh, well, I, let's let's just talk out loud here. So, you know, for for me, my preferred way of addressing a uh, a five one isthmic spondy is with an a lift. Um, so, I've been doing a lot of these laterally. So, the lateral a lift. Uh, at the same time, that might give you access to um, the to do a lateral transoas approach as well. Um, or, or anti psoas whatever you prefer. I think the issue there is you, you've got the hardware there uh, that you have to address, have to address, as, address well, as well, which would be difficult to, difficult to, to, to address in a uh, lateral fashion. So, you know, you can, you know, you could think about exposing the whole, whole, whole hardware, taking it out, repositioning, but you know, that's a lot of position changing there, right? Um, you know, alternatively, uh, you know, you could do an A-lift supine, flip her prone. And a lot of what I'm doing lately is, you know, single position approaches with a prone lateral where you could expose the old hardware, remove that. Um, you know, think about your solution at two, three. Um, you know, if, uh, you know, you'd want to probably remove that cage at two, three. I mean, it's not easy doing it from a lateral approach and definitely not easy doing it in a prone lateral approach. Um, you know, the other consideration is you, if you have to do a corpectomy there as well. Um, and then I would probably stabilize her up to, uh, I mean, I, I would, you know, you'd want to optimize her, her bone, uh, biology prior, but, you know, I'd probably at least stabilize her up to, uh, the distal pelvis at T10 and, and go down to the ilium, if not higher. Those are all very good points. Rod, so you've seen this patient before and also, so, um, the initial surgeon kind of didn't see her very much anymore, but told her this is as good as it gets, um, get with it. Is simple hardware removal something, because you can't sit anymore. The, yeah. the rods are literally sticking, not through the skin, but one epidermal yeah. layer away. So follow up on compromised patients um, uh, and just kind of doing something less invasive where you just take the hard route and say, let's, let's live with this. Is that an option? I mean, I think it did. Uh... I think Brian did a great job of presenting this. I mean, I think eight years is, seems like a pretty reasonable amount of time. Um, and it looks like it didn't work. So, I mean, I don't think you, I don't think there's many options left here. All right, why don't you uh, do the drum roll and the great reveal. Yes, yeah, so we did operate. Um, we did take out the hardware from two to five and uh, we did address that cage at two, three as well. Um, it was frankly loose and uh, without uh, too much bony work, it, it came out um, in block. Uh, we thoroughly irrigated that area and treated it like, a, like an infected um, discitis. However, we didn't see any uh, gross tissue changes that would make us think that this was an actively infected area. Um, we did a revision decompression there and um, if I remember correctly, we did uh, like a subtotal corpectomy a little, little bit. <laughs> Um, we did a three column osteotomy at one, two, two, three, five, one, and then we fused her from uh, seven to pelvis. Um, it was a fairly uncomplicated surgery. She got two drains and 1200 DBL. These are her uh, standing films on the left pre-op and then her CT scout films on the right um, after surgery, um, demonstrating the correction of her uh, so we used, uh, we did this as a single stage just posteriorly and uh, again went through the pains of doing almost a subtotal corpectomy lower 40% of the vertebral bodies and washed that all out. And I was very pleased with our uh, interdiscal osteotomy technique. It was actually not that hard to take out that cage and we did an osteotomy at the level next to that. And uh, yes, uh, you're very, very astute, Dr. Chang. Of course you were, um, five one was, completely unstable and she had a pretty impressive grayish synovial hypertrophy zone that completely obliterated her L5 roots uh, uh, that we painstakingly resected. That was actually almost more difficult than taking out the cages. 
uh, and we did do a transition zone instrumentation that'll hopefully hold. Her bone stock was actually not that bad. She was anti, on anti-resorptus for like two years, um, and she's on ongoing steroids, so she's actually done very well so far. Any comments on this? I mean, the blood loss wasn't horrendous, but it was, a, I think, Brian, a painful surgery, right? Still, it was yeah. seven or eight hours. Yeah. Uh, single incision, you'd be proud of me, Dr. Chang, all prone. Uh, <laughs> right. Comments? No, that, that's that's great. I mean, uh, yeah, I think, you know, and then a lot of times the, uh, the, the traditional ways are the best, right? That's why they're still around, just everything prone and... Uh, you know, it looks like a great correction and looks like a good result. So that's, that's awesome. So one thing that I see a lot, and this goes a little bit off topic, Dr. Chang is, um, because it is so eminently doable, I see a lot of patients who get L3 to five or L2 to five minimally invasive, uh, fusions done. Uh, and it's just one of those things where, where I'm not totally sure how well that always serves patients. There are clearly some patients have that middle lumbar degeneration where that seems to be very apropos. But what are your thoughts on these kind of limited lumbar, thank you, Brian, uh, limited lumbar fusions with leaving five one alone when there may be pathology or the longer term future of that L5 is one disc is in doubt. How, how do you see those surviving in the longer run? Yeah, I think it depends uh, on the I mean, a lot of it's patient specific, obviously, um, you know, I think if you're doing, like you say, like a multi-level mid lumbar construct, like two to five or, or three to five, you really have to scrutinize what's going on at L5S1 uh, because that, that's a natural failure point um, that you, you're creating there. And so, um, you know, I, I think it's one of these things that we don't have a great answer for because um, oftentimes, you know, there, you know, you regret not in including five, one in your construct. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then there's also the other times where you do regret <laughs> including five, one in your construct as well. So, um, you know, I, I think paying attention to just how the, the disc and the facets look between five, one, if you're going to think about stopping at five is, is an important thing. Um, I guess in a perfect world, we could do. A lifts or a nice T lift at five one and, and bridge everyone, but um, but then again you run into the issue with <clears throat> you know lucency of hardware at S one or you know if you need to do pelvic fixation on everyone. So it's it's kind of um, you know I, I don't think there's a great great answer, but it's something to be to be uh, aware of when you're planning these things out. Great, ready for another one? If yes, Neil Patel is here and he has another case. Thank you for those great discussion points. All right, great. So my talk is on a patient that we did yesterday. So I'll have a lot more recent kind of information on this. Um, so this is a 68 year old lady who has very, very um, <coughs> unfortunate kind of history and course, but uh, she's developed seizures in grade school. And due to these seizures, had multiple falls, multiple uh, leg um, fractures, uh, ankle fractures, got nine surgeries overall, uh, had uh, both knees and hip, hips replaced. She's on Keppra for a seizure. She's been moving around. She has uh, no significant uh, family support. So she went from, North, uh, from uh, East Coast, up and down East Coast, and now is on the West Coast. She lives with a friend and her husband. Um, had double mastectomy done uh, at an early age, had a heart attack at an early age as well, and then unfortunately started having some heart failure uh, more recently, about seven years ago. Had bladder prolapse, had to get hysterectomy and uh, bladder repair, et cetera. But this all becomes important because uh, she goes to, she went to an outside hospital with um, so concerns of chest pain, again, from her heart issues, maybe with shortness of breath, things like that. And they did a CTPE. These are the imaging for CTPE. They didn't find a significant pulmonary embolus, but they did have, she did have, I think, uh, some small DVTs at, uh, at that point. Um, and was, again, just uh, sent home without any significant referral or follow-up. They chalked off the urinary and fecal incontinence to bladder prolapse and hysterectomy surgery. 
um, and uh, they didn't didn't send her to anybody. Uh, so again, no workup for spine after that image, uh, no follow up uh, from this outside hospital at all. Uh, she was seen in our clinic four months after the CT scan that I just showed uh, with uh, inability to walk independently. She needed a lot of support, uh, a walker to walk, had significant myelopathy, clonus, uh, lower extremity strength was one out of five in uh, distal e plantar flexion, dorsiflexion. Approximately, she was three to fours in hip flexion, knee flexion extension, barely able to stand up, uh, hunch forward due to this uh, kyphotic deformity. And uh, at this point, uh, what workup do you, would you like to pursue in clinic? Uh, so we ended up doing uh, cervical and lumbar as well because of significant myelopathy. <coughs> Clearly no significant discs there. And we did do a thoracic MRI and you could see, again, significant kyphoid deformity, significant, severe stenosis, the central uh, canal. Dr. Chang, what's going on there? Why does a patient's spine dislocate like this? If it's just osteoporosis, wouldn't it just kyphose? What's this um, patho mechanism that we see going on here? Yeah, I mean, could you go back to the, the CT there real quick? What are you looking for there? Well, when you look at it, I mean, it almost looks like a hemivertebrae, just the morphology there. Um, you know, I haven't seen a ton of those, but you, when you do see them, it's it's um, something you kind of wonder about. It, it doesn't seem like it has that morphology. For some reason, I'm not, I'm not seeing on speaker view. Uh, sorry, maybe scroll through that, that coronal again. Sorry, one second. So significant biplanar deformity. Um, right. Vertebra slipped out of place. I mean, for me, uh, this is uh, Dr. O's patient. Uh, this is pretty shocking to see. Also, I was stumbling like you were about what's going on there. But uh, for pure osteoporosis, it's almost a little bit uncommon to have this dislocation. Let, let's put uh, Dr. O on yeah. the microphone. Rod, what are your thoughts as you saw this? I mean, this is almost like a vertebral plana. Um, and she had multiple falls. So it's just one of these things. I mean, I think actually we're seeing it more and more, you know, um, and uh, osteoporosis, um, I think, you know, is the underlying um, pathology here and uh, you know it was a very compromised patient medically um, and she presented with some peripheral edema and then her cardiologist was concerned about aortic stenosis so we ended up admitting her she got an angiogram cardiac evaluation um, and uh, you know I mean these are difficult cases So um, any thoughts now? So this looks pretty bad. Uh, Biplan deformity, uh, thoracic myelopathy, which to this point reaches a NURIC 4 probably, right? Yeah, um, yeah NURIC 4. Um, so urinary bowel incontinence. Both incontinent, but initially chalked off to hysterectomy and uh, pelvic floor surgery, yeah. but clearly has some role here as well. So any, any thoughts? Surgery, this is obviously a compromised host, <laughs> uh, significant deformity, significant dissolution of a vertebra. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, with her neurologic status, I, I don't think you have the luxury of of optimizing her bone beforehand. So, uh, you know, I think it's just one of these cases where you, you want to throw the kitchen sink at her. Uh, but I think wh whatever level that is, you know, vertebral column resection, you'd probably have a pretty, um, uh, you know, you'd be able to, you know, reduce that uh, biplanar deformity. And then, you know, you would want a long segment fixation. Um, you know, I think, you know, for someone with osteoporosis and they have these fractures, I think considering augmentation of your screws with uh, cement is another um, another consideration. And um, yeah, you I mean, like I said, you just anything you think that might help, you, you know, throw the kitchen sink at her. 
like a external bone stimulator afterward as well. And I'm um, curious to see what you guys did. What, what cage would you use in a patient like this? Obviously very soft bone. Is there any cage preference that you would have in uh, this kind of a setting? So both to form yeah. as well as yeah. management. I, I mean, I, I think, I mean, we'll, we'll get into it with the top with my talk uh, a little bit later, which I guess is a good setup. Uh, but, you know, I, I think with, um, you know, with an expandable type corpectomy cage, that gives you a little bit more um, flexibility. Uh, I mean, it depends if you're trying to reduce, uh, you know, reduce in place, you might just consider putting in a tall T-lift cage. Uh, a lot of it just depends on what kind of window you have once you do the, once you're done with the, the VCR. Um, and then I would probably think about putting a structural allograft next to your cage as well, uh, to, because you know, your, your, your fusion mass through uh, a cage, you know, um, is not, not the greatest. So, um, like I said, you want to, you know, you probably for your VCR resection, you'll probably harvest, you probably need, need to take off some rib there anyway. So you can, you, you can, you can, um, repurpose that as, as a structural allograft as well. Great points, Neil. Cool. Take us sure, forward. Sure. Uh, some of the things exactly we love it we, exactly what we kind of considered and did as well. Some of the things that what we noted as well were pedicles were pretty pretty thin at all levels. We did three levels above and three levels below. Uh, there was a compression fracture at the T9 as well. This is T7 vertebra plana, but T9 is pretty uh, was compressed as well, at least starting to as well. So agree with your uh, plan, and we ended up doing cement augmentation at the two levels below, uh, especially at that uh, compressed level at T9 and T10. We did uh, screws from T3 to T10. Uh, we did VCR, as you mentioned, um, at T7, and uh, essentially got it in line with the levels above and below, uh, as well, a cross connector, and got really good reduction uh, sagittal balance uh, correction uh, as well, uh, and coronal, significant coronal cor uh, correction as well with uh, a little bit of compression unilaterally. Uh, and post-op, uh, intra-op, she had significant uh, improvement in her uh, neuro monitoring signal uh, as soon as we did the VCR and corrected her. And post-op, she's doing great. She has some uh, incisional pain, but- Can you uh, scroll through the uh, sagittal images again? There are people online who want to see what you did there. What kind of a cage did you use, Rod? We did it with VCR. Yeah. We did full collapse. Yeah. yeah. So what do you think about a VCR where you just basically collapse the spine down without a spacer, Dr. Chang? Yeah, no, I, I think that's, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's definitely a good option. You, 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 um, you avoid the potential um, uh, uh, morbidity from having a cage subsiding, especially if you're, if you're her bones suspect there. So, um, you know, I, I think that you get a good reduction there and, uh, you have bone, bone on bone there. So, um, you know, hopefully it holds together, but I think avoiding a cage is totally reasonable. Rod, any plans uh, to put a cage in? And uh, where are you? You've done a lot of far lateral surgeries. Is the thoracic spine something that you can access through the ribs or something like that? Um, I mean, I think for me, I don't really need a cage in this situation. I think if you're going to do vertebrectomy, I think you can probably do that as well. But I just think, you know, um, this was a very compromised patient. She was really sick. And, um, you know, I think she just needed that focal correction. Actually, it was very difficult um, to get that osteophyte. It was pretty stuck to the cord and the dura. So, um, you know, I think, what do you think, Jens? I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily, I don't think you need to do a vertebrectomy all the time, but she had such a focal kyphosis that I thought just taking that wedge of bone out would help her the most. I think that's uh, this vertebral body is without repair. At least. Yeah. So I, I would have I tried to put a spacer in, but again, in a patient with fragile neurology, uh, this is a very reasonable approach. And uh, did you check for TB, by the way, when you sent off organisms? Um, well, we didn't. They, she wasn't. There wasn't any. I mean, there was no sign of infection. We weren't really 
Dr. Dr. Kaler was uh, wanting to point out that yeah. there could be an infection on there, and uh, especially TB is a very smart yeah. thing because they can be the great imitator. Because it is unusual for osteoporotic fractures to dislocate like this. Right. right. And uh, relatively atraumatic, meaning non uh, injury mechanism, non. But she had a lot she of falls. She, from she seizures. Fall she has fallen yeah. from seizures. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so this is probably the mechanic. Yeah. Right. And she has multiple compression fractures throughout her lumbar And I like spine. the cemented screws. How often, Dr. Chang, do you use cemented screws now? Um, I think, you know, as Rod mentioned, we, we see a lot more of these vertebral plana type fractures, so pretty much always in, in those cases. Um, and, uh, you know, typically, you know, for, for more of an elective case, um, you know, I try to optimize our bone health beforehand with some anabolic agents, so... Uh, I think maybe in those cases, you don't have to if, if, if the, the bone stock is better, but um, definitely for any of these uh, vertebral insufficiency fractures, if you're going to treat them, um, uh, treat them surgically. Great job. Difficult case. Thank Thanks, you. Sir. She's very happy with the results. She's crying ha of her happiness. Nice. Good job. Yeah, that's great. Next, we have Dr. Garrett Lute, and he's going to show another case variant. He's done a great job as a research fellow here. He's from Bochum, Germany. And Dr. Lewick um, has selected another case with cage problems, cage questions. Absolutely. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. I would like to present you a case of a 63-year-old gentleman with progressive neck pain but dominating back pain and right hip pain, uh, BAS 8 out of 10. Uh, also suffering from severe bi bilateral hand dysfunction. The pain flared uh, when changing positions and turning. Um, moreover, he developed an inability to stand straight with a significant forward pitched position um, and also has an extensive history of spine surgeries. So regarding the past medical histories, uh, within the uh, last 10 years before um, uh, we saw in our clinic, he uh, received seven spine surgeries. Um, like finally spanning with a um, cervical spinal fusion from C2 to T2 and L1 to L5. Um, seven surgeries, as I already mentioned, um, always problems with non-fusion uh, in the past. And then finally, uh, coming to our clinic, apart from the spinal surgeries, um, he's a, a chronic opioid uh, intake, he's a smoker, and also a history of methamphetamine um, and marijuana um, intake. Regarding the physical exam, we see a reduced motoric function, especially a distal weakness um, in the hands and in the lower limbs. Um, we also saw a hyper uh, reflexia um, in um, the upper and the lower limbs, and um, also a significant reduced sensation in the sensory system. Um, regarding the labs, there were no elevated infection parameters or other abnormalities. So this is, uh, yeah, the first the first X-ray so far. We already see where where is the problem. Um, uh, right here, this very like significant and severe uh, kyphotic development in the thoracolumbar junction, especially. Um, yeah. Then we continued with a CT. Let me just show the pictures to you. So, yeah, regarding the cervical spine, um, we see an unchanged position of the of the how, hardware uh, and situation post uh, bony uh, and a bony fusion after ACDF from C3 to, to uh, C6, as well as a decompression posterior instrumentation C2 to T2. Uh, we see multi-level cervical spondylosis, especially uh, on the level of C2 C3 but no significant um, central or foraminal stenosis at this level. Um, regarding the thoracic spine, uh, we see um, yeah, multi-level thoracic um, spondylosis, most significantly on the level between T7 and T12, where we have also a multi-level central foraminal stenosis and a high-grade cord impingement as classified by, by our radiologists. Yeah. Now we're getting into this area right there, most significantly C7 to T12. And finally, in the lumbar spine, um, we see an incomplete interbody um, posterior bony fusion at the level of L1, L2. Um, 
also with the um, loosening of the pedicle screw at this level and also an impingement symptomatic um, at the level of the cord equina. Yeah, and moreover, as we already see here, especially in the sagittal images, we have a severe kyphotic deformity with 25 degree between T4 and L1, uh, lumbar lordosis uh, minus 20 degree, pelvic tilt of 50 degree, um, pelvic incidence of 61 degree, which uh, significantly progressed to his previous images. So just to, just to summarize what we have so far, from the clinical point of view, we have a continuing neck, but more severely back and right hip pain uh, with significant postural and functional deficit after multiple prior spine surgeries with current fusion constructs spanning L1 to L5 and C2 to T2. And um, in status post cervical thoracic fusion with moderate cervical thoracic kyphosis with hardware failure, in addition to a decompensated precarious progressive thoracic scoliosis at the thoracolumbar junction, as we saw um, with the residual foramenal stenosis, um, especially on the level L1, L5, with a non-union and skage, as well as screw loosening. So far. Yeah. Go back to the initial survey shot. So mm -hmm. I don't even know how many surgeries he's now had. He's had ne multiple neck surgeries and then mm -hmm. uh, multiple low back surgeries. and. Uh, a lot of those, uh, actually, it all started with MIS, and he's had yeah. just this escalation of MIS surgeries uh, over time. He was never formally fused at 5-1. Uh, so again, same theme as before, a slightly different variant. What's gone sour here? Why did he not heal on the top? Is the top more prone towards failures if you do these mid lumbar fusions than the bottom? Uh, Dr. Chang, your thoughts? Sorry, I unmute myself. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely not a fan of stopping at L1 and then the unilateral fixation. You know, I, I think, um, you know, that, that's the issue with minimally invasive. Doesn't doesn't let you to be lazy, you know, to <laughs> to to not do a, a good construct. And so, you know, I think probably just not adhering to the, your 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 basic biomechanical principles. You know, stopping at a at a mobile segment there. Um, and then with the thoracic, uh, I was having a little difficulty, hard time making out the, the um, cervical thoracic views there. Go back to the uh, initial, uh, Garrett. To the, uh, to the, the initial x-rays, yeah. So he's had anterior posterior surgeries and he has an upper thoracic gibbous. Uh, it starts okay. at day one. I think the hardware there was not done uh, with a good anchoring function. So the stop like at T1 and he tipped forwards and he has a substantial kyphosis at T3, 4 and at I think T2, 3. He has cervical myelopathy without a doubt. Uh, although he has substance abuse issues, this man I need to point out is a business owner and uh, an extremely driven man. And yes, he smoked like a chimney stack and um, uh, that was kind of sad to see. And, Again, I, I would say this was a very sad story because this is a man with a business. Uh, he's married, his family, and uh, very hard working, very determined, and significantly strung out on opiates. And then when the physicians withdrew those in our state, we have significant opiate caps, um, uh, went to street drugs. So it's very sad. But yeah, so he's starting to invaginate his craniocervical junction uh, because he's so keen on hyperextending his craniocervical junction. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a real tough case. Um, you know, I, I think there's there's multiple areas to address. And I'm kind of curious if the answer was that you did everything all at once from cervical all the way down. <clears throat> That's a good question. We had that as a discussion point because again, there's radial loosens. If you go to the CT sagittal one more mm -hmm. time, Garrett, as a nice composite of the left image, he had substantial radial loosens around his upper hardware. And again, I'm with uh, Izzy Lieberman. Uh, I'm very leery that there's at least opportunistic infection when we see this kind of a pronounced radial loosency. Uh, maybe a little bit paranoid, but Izzy quotes like th literally a third, uh, so 35% um, of hardware with radial loosens, he has at least opportunistic uh, propionibacter, as is now called cudibacter, or uh, staph epidermidis or something like that growing in there. I don't know, are, are you leery of infections when you see these um, things going on? 
Uh, not not as much. I mean, I, I think you'd be suspicious um, as to. I mean, there's one theory of disease that everything everything is linked to infection, right? There's some 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 pathogen that that causes you to have you know it could be ruptured aneurysm, right? So, I mean, I, I don't think that's totally off base to suspect there's a there's some sort of um, infection, uh, uh, you know, a subtle infection there that's causing this. Yeah, I'm, I'm just probably a little bit too paranoid. The point is that I did not want to go to the cervical spine right now, so I told the patient with stages. Garrett, why don't you go ahead and show us what we did? Yes. So this is this is what we do. At, as Dr. Chapman already said, we didn't do the um, cervical revision. We just uh, said that we will plan to do it in um, six to seven months, so later. What we did was a hardware revision, decompression, posterior segmental instrumentation infusion, T7 through pelvis, with re-instrumentation, including replacement of all screws at L1, at L2 through L5 area, the three-column osteotomy with decompression, uh, T11, T12, T12, L1, L1, L2, with deformity correction of the thoracolumbar junction, uh, kyphotic development that we saw, uh, as well as the L2, L1 posterior vision laminectomy for aminotomy, decompression, and the L1, L2 cage removal and reconstruction. This is what we did, and this is what it looked like afterwards, so post-surgically. <coughs> this is like the first, like the scout views, and then we don't have this time like a full spine CT, but we have a thoracic and a lumbar. And you're right, Dr. Chang, this was, um, there's no infection that we could see. We treated like an infection. We have the sauroscopy, irrigators, we wash out everything. I worked very, we worked, Dr. Oskurian came in and we actually mm -hmm. did this together and I'll ask him for his opinion about this case. We worked very hard on getting an intradiscal osteotomy going with expandable cages and all and full releases and we could not get him cranked out as far as I wanted to. I think we got him much better, but Rod, any thoughts? Um, I mean, I think one of the things that uh, wasn't brought up is I think, you know, the preoperative, I think this guy was seen for two years. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I saw him originally, and um, you know he's a smoker, chronic um, pain, basically it turned into a chronic pain patient. Um, and uh, you know, when I'd seen how many surgeries he had, um, you know, I was like, "Gosh, you know, this guy's going to need something really big." And then I sent him to Yens, and then I think you know, Yens, you did a really good job of like prehabbing him. I think that's really important, you know, for someone like this. Because if you do all the surgery and they're smoking two packs a day, it doesn't really matter. They're just gonna they're gonna pseudo and not heal. Um, so I think the preoperative evaluation is important. And then he kind of had like an ankle. It was a spine. I mean, it was really rigid, mm -hmm. um, especially from L one. I mean, you can see from L one L five. I mean, he just had basically a straight, if not kyphotic, lumbar spine. And I think it was smart not just to ignore the cervical thoracic junction for now, because um, it's fused there. And then, you know, if you need to do something, I mean, I think you're going to unfortunately going to have to connect the two. So in terms of deformity correction, we worked very hard. Um, we pried them apart very hard, but we were not successful in getting a full lordosis. Do you see it as a problem? Would you have had any technical trips, uh, tricks or tips to kind of uh, get more lordosis out of him? Yeah, and no, I think that's the uh, <clears throat> that's the million dollar question in a lot of these cases. Just you get in there, you have a good plan to do it, and it works in most cases. But then, just the patient's just not compliant, you know, um, as far as their anatomy. Yeah, it's interesting that um, you know Rod's comment about being ankylosed. I mean, part of it wonders, you know, with just the chronic hardware failure, if that's like a reactionary. Uh, physiologic response from the bone just to being under such you know stress and load from the failed hardware and things like that if if, if that's um you know something iatrogenic that's happened too so but you know I, I think in this case you you got you know you did as best as you know the patient would allow so um, unfortunately not everything's a home run as the patient actually was incredibly grateful. I was uh, very pleased to see it. We were obviously worried and we spent a lot of time and willpower discussions uh, about um, prehabbing and uh, he played ball. I mean, he went uh, cold turkey and um, uh, uh, on his nicotine and went through a formal detox program and was uh, impressive with that, I have to say. 
I have to give him kudos. That that was uh, as good a prehab. It took over a year, um, and we were obviously watching him with um, uh, eagle eyes. And Dr. O and I collaborated on this. We literally ganged up on him and spent a lot of time in him. But he was so happy after surgery, right, Rod? <laughs> yeah. And he knows he'll get a second yeah. surgery. He basically wanted us to do the second surgery where we'll tie into the upper construct. Uh, we'll do an upper thoracic osteotomy, but um, and connect, uh, take out his cervical thoracic hardware and his upper C-spine hardware. But so I think there's still some deformity correction, hopefully, to be done. Uh, I was just a little bit chagrined that I couldn't get uh, 10 degrees more out of uh, one of those ideas. Yeah. Right, Rod? We worked hard on it. Yeah, right? I mean, th these are very challenging cases. So. Good. All right. And we have, I think, one more case. Thank you, Garrett. Sorry to bombard you like this, Dr. Chang, but uh, oh. so great to have you. Dr. Chang, as uh, stated, is from the Henry Ford uh, Health System. And Dr. Gautam Rao has just come back from vacation and is freshly energized. Uh, Dr. Rao is from USF, uh, University of South Florida, uh, one of the great neurosurgery programs. And we've had a real pleasure. And great time having you here for half a year as an enfolded fellow. So thanks for your hard work, Gautam, and look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. Uh, presentation, I have uh, no disclosures. A 78-year-old female at the time uh, came to our clinic uh, complaining of mainly low back, but in left lower extremity radiculopathy. Um, she had a history of a previous L4-5 Lamy back in 2014. Uh, she has a known kind of scoliotic deformity at that time as well, but she's had symptomatic relief from that Lamy, but she's been progressively worsening in terms of her pain. Um, <clears throat> her motor exam uh, just had some weakness in the left lower extremity in all muscle groups, likely pain related, otherwise no other uh, relevant uh, abnormalities in the neurologic exam. This is her pre-op scoliosis films. You can see that she has a significant uh, levoscoliosis uh, as well as, you know, interestingly, <clears throat> a kyphotic deformity at uh, the upper lumbar levels. Um, her SVA is actually kind of okay in terms of where the sacrum uh, lies, but you can obviously see that there's a deformity there. Uh, the first surgery we did on her was a uh, T8 to pelvis uh, and a L1 to 5 uh, intradiscal osteotomy in order to correct her um, uh, scoliosis in the coronal plane as well as in the sagittal plane. Uh, this is her uh, post-operative films, post-operative standing scoli x-rays, uh, as you can see compared to previous, uh, the coronal deformity is, is improved and the sagittal plane deformity is also improved. We did, like I said, multiple level of IDOs in order to get good release of the um, uh, spine in order to really reconstruct the quad rods as well uh, and did uh, TP hooks um, there, so. <clears throat> So, so you see a certain theme. So this is a, a system or an approach I like. I like a single stage, and uh, we did an open reduction of this patient with a very complex deformity, and uh, I think a four-level interdiscal osteotomy had a full deformity correction. We did junctional banding with uh, cables and hooks, and um, despite this and bracing, um, the uh, patient. Um, kind of just collapsed uh, like I think six weeks out or something. Yeah, like she, she had so fallen actually um, a few weeks before clinic uh, and just had worsening pain and trouble walking and uh, presented to clinic. Um, well, at that time we'd gotten some uh, CT scans in order to uh, evaluate what was going on. Um, <clears throat> So you can see here, uh, there's actually a two-level compression fracture with some retropulsion on the inferior uh, T9 here. Um, and she also had, you can kind of see here, but the, the hardware was the, the um, um, hooks were kind of protruding out, out of her skin. Likely they fractured or from the fracture kind of kicked off. Um, so we ended up having to obviously revise her, giving her uh, worsening neurologic status, compression fractures, worsening deformity, and hardware uh, failure. Um, so we did hardware removal, extension up to T2, uh, and a, a two-level corpectomy T8 and T9 uh, in order to um, fix this.
So, so this is a question here, yeah. So we did a two-level corpectomy and a cage. We did this rather originally because the patient came from a nursing home and had neurologically deteriorated within, I think, 48 hours yeah. beforehand. And she had a pretty significant core, thoracic level cord injury. Uh, we actually decided not to do a VCR, but we did a um, two-level corpectomy and a metal cage that we filled with bone. So any thoughts on, so this is a whole new uh, can of worms, but uh, your thoughts on these kind of large titanium expandable cages and getting bone healing. I think you addressed it a little bit before with putting allograft around there. Yeah, I, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I guess a lot of people debate, you know, whether or not you actually get a full column of bone through these types of things. Um, you know, with the, um, when you think about Wolf's law, this is kind of the, 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 the opposite of what you want to achieve, right? Because you don't have the the graft under under tension um, or under you know under force. Right. So yeah. um, I think you know in in my experience, you know, you try to maximize the footprint as much as possible. Um, but you know, I think a lot of the failures that you see in these expandable cages, especially for corpectomy or vertebrectomy, is that you don't have a long segment stabilization uh, posteriorly. Um, and so in, in those cases, I think that's where you're, you're more set up for failure. So I, I think, you know, I would do exactly what, what you would have done in, in this case. So, um, you know, an expandable cage with the, the corpectomy, um, you know, and then, <clears throat> uh, to your earlier point, whether or not this is something that, you know, using cement augmented screws for, um, would be helpful. It's, it's kind of hard to know, um, you know, I, I think with uh, some of the emerging PJK literature is just that, um, you know, some folks, they're just used to living with more positive sagittal balance. So, you know, the more you correct them, the, that's a little bit more, um, uh, they're more prone to ha having these proximal failures. So, uh, I mean, it's a difficult issue um, and, you, you know, either way you slice it. So, um, but it looks like a good result there. Yeah, she actually has made a very nice recovery from her. Are these the most recent x-rays? Yeah, we yeah. just saw her in clinic, and she's actually ambulatory again. She came in as an Asia C. We treated her like a true spinal cord injury. Took her to the OR in the middle of the night and the two-level corpectomy. Not exactly my most preferred thing to do, to heroic right. surgery in the middle of the night, but uh, it actually uh, has worked out reasonably well so far. But uh, it was uh, kind of sobering to see this acute deterioration on a patient. and. Um, the delay in uh, messaging of neurologic decline in a nursing home was, in a pretty good nursing home also, was uh, pretty saddening to see. Yeah. You know, I think, it, you know, it's a good learning point for the fellows and whoever's on. When, when you see a proximal junctional failure, that, that's an extremely unstable state. So I think you did exactly what you should treat them like a spinal cord injury. Like, you know, you treat them like someone coming in through the, the trauma bay. So um, because, you know, I, I think... You know, un you know, fortunately, unfortunately, we have a certain level of comfort seeing some hardware failures from from degenerative, you know, after degenerative type cases, but they're not, you know, inherently unstable like you you would be with a fracture. But you know, I think with a proximal junctional failure, it's like a whole nother beast because, um, you know, there, there's just um, such a profound instability that you get to develop that sort of pathology. You really have to be uh, respectful of it. Great. Any th learning insights as you review this case for you, Gautam, what would you have done at uh, Tampa? Yeah, I think we would have done something very similar. Obviously, looking at her initial, uh, you know, uh, films, I think going up to T8 was reasonable. It's kind of where the, the curve starts to straighten out. Um, doing the multiple level IDOs, also kind of what we would have done. We may have done um, maybe a PSO as well, but we were able to, you were able to get good lordosis here. So I think it's definitely doable um with the ideos and then like you're saying um <clears throat> it is odd that they had that fracture there you know her bone stock looked pretty good so it's probably just from the trauma um but definitely um doing a two column um corpectomy or a two level corpectomy is definitely what we would have done and um maybe we would have gone to t4 t3 maybe not down all the way up to t2 but um, otherwise, that would we're that's what we would do. We may have cement augmented as well, just to um, have kind of good, um, stronger uh, space for the corpectomy cage to sit. 
um, and the, the, the two of our two bodies above and below. But other than that, I think um, what, we, what we did here was uh, on par what we uh, would have done in Tampa. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you to our fellows. Thank you, Gautam. Thank you, appreciate it. Good job, thank you. So again, thank you all for coming here together uh, this morning. I wish you'd be here in person, I said earlier, because we have uh, Orthofix slash C-spine or C-spine slash Orthofix here with their 7D system. And they have a great display here, so non-ionizing image guidance. Um, this morning's uh, honored guest speaker is Dr. Victor Chang. He's a system spine director for the Henry Ford Health System uh, and the vice chair of research in the Department of Neurosurgery. He's an associate professor in the Wayne State University uh, School of Medicine System and in Michigan State. Um, he uh, works out of the Henry Ford West Bloomfield Hospital. Um, he is uh, a graduate of first Stanford and then has medical school at the University of Michigan. We will not ask him about uh, sign stealing or anything like that, that's off limits. Uh, he's done his internship and residency at Henry Ford and he did his, fellow, his, his fellowship at UCLA and then returned to Henry Ford since 2014. He's a nationally eminent figure in the double ANS and joint section and he is a uh, well, thought of highly regarded and coveted speaker. Uh, he chose the topic of expandable or modified cages nowadays and we're, uh, hopefully we whetted everybody's appetite for this discussion and his presentation with our various uh, case uh, struggles that we had. And this is clearly something that we need to uh, have the best possible knowledge and technology combined to get the best possible results and the anterior column has been much overlooked for too long. Dr. Chang, we're looking forward to your presentation and thanks for taking the time to joining us. All right, thank you for the kind intro. Um, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I always love coming out um, to uh, the Seattle Science Foundation for all the courses. So um, really happy to be, uh, uh, really honored to be a participant here. So um, share my slides. Okay. All right, is that working for everybody? Yes. yes. All right, perfect. Um, so yeah, so I was asked to to talk about uh, novel cage design and innovation. So, um, you know, this is something that's been a core part of my practice since I started. Um, you know, it's kind of hard to believe, um, you know, almost a decade in practice now. Um, so these are my disclosures, uh, mostly for uh, education, uh, nothing product related. Um, so uh, there's that. Um, but again, my biggest disclosure is I'm, I'm a big proponent of technology for inner body cage um, uh, use. And so, um, you know, this is something that is uh, near and dear to, to my core interests in, within spine. So uh, what is the motivation for cage innovation, right? Um, the question is, why do we need to innovate cage design? So, you know, to break it down, um, you know, you think about the initial ask of the inner body cage, right? So you have things like disc space reconstruction. Um, so treating either loss of disc height or in some cases reducing spondylolisthesis. Um, so that's an initial ask. Uh, and then your other ask is to provide a substrate for intervertebral arthrodesis. And uh, this is especially important with some of the minimally invasive approaches that are out there where we don't really rely on a posterior lateral fusion. Um, you know, I do lateral anterior and uh, T-lift techniques and I, I know a lot of folks, when they do a minimally invasive T-lift, they, they still do a little posterior lateral arthrodesis. Uh, I, I am not in that group. I, I, do, I rely solely on the uh, intervertebral arthrodesis you get from the cage. Um, and then uh, basically the other things that we've asked for our cages is that once we've, uh, with our in increasing understanding of sagittal parameters, so cages have become a tool for increasing segmental lordosis. So um, I think those examples of the interdiscal uh, osteotomy is, are, are great examples. And so when we think of a traditional cage, we think, um, you know, these peak monolithic cages. Um, and so uh, what I'd like to introduce is these two concepts, limitations of geometry and limitations of bioactivity. Um, so these are things that uh, when you're trying to, you know, build a better mousetrap for, for lack of a better term, what, what we're trying to address with traditional cage design. Um, so, uh, you know, your problems with, um, with geometry. So thinking about the initial, uh, you know, this, this example with this cages. So addressing limitations of geometry, uh, we want to be able to increase the lordotic angle. 
Um, so because, you know, sagittal, sagittal balance, you know, increasing lordosis, especially in degenerative pathology, that, that's, that's the name of the game. Um, in addition to that, we also want to be able to increase the footprint within the intervertebral disc space, uh, as well as disc height. So, you know, restoring foramina height, um, but also providing a good substrate for, um, uh, for the inner body arthrodesis. Uh, and then in addition, we have to think about delivery of the device through a constrained corridor. And this is particularly the case for MIS T-LIF, uh, or if you do an endoscopic T-LIF, you, you have a, a constrained space to deliver your device. So you have to be able to get around this, um, this constraint. And one of the solutions to this has been the evolution of expandable technology, uh, which we'll show some more examples on. Um, and then looking at our other limitation, the limitations of bioactivity, so again, we've talked about the burden of arthrodesis solely on the inner body space. Uh, and then one of the inherent disadvantages of polyether ether ketone or PEAK is that um, the, the surface is hydrophobic and it does not really create an interface with bone. And so this is, uh, uh, you know, when you're thinking about the traditional monolithic PEAK cage, this is something that we, uh, we want to try to overcome. Um, so one solution potentially is to create a surface that's more interesting for the bone to interface. Uh, and then with that, you have the evolution of different surface technologies. Um, so we'll, we'll get into a few examples of that as well. Um, <clears throat> so as far as for reasons to use expandable cages, um, there's some ease of deployment, especially in the minimally invasive applications. Uh, theoretically, there's production of end plate to provide subsidence. Now, a lot of this is just if you don't have to do a lot of trialing with a progressive, with uh, you, you get the trauma from when, when you insert a trial. <laughs> Um, that's that's thought to be some of the theoretical benefit for, for preventing subsidence. Um, and then there's a lot of designs, especially if you look at some of the current offerings in the market that allow for uh, maximizing a segmental lordosis. Um, as far as for reasons against expandable cages, um, you know, in, in, in theory, it's thought to lead to higher rates of pseudoarthrosis. So again, um, like I talked about, violation of Wolf's Law, you don't have the direct apposition onto the bone grafts, but there's uh, ways around this. Um, there's also about concerns about implant design failure. So if you have an expansion mechanism, what's what's the um, uh, what's the mode for failure there? Um, you know, especially if you're putting quite a bit of load on on these cages. Uh, and then finally is the the the, the question of cost. Um, you know, a lot of this technology is pay, uh, priced as a premium. Um, I, I think you know, from a vendor, from a industry standpoint, they put a lot of investment in terms of R and D and marketing. Uh, they want to try to recoup that with um, the cost of the implant. Um, but, you know, we're in an environment where, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, the, the, what we get in reimbursed or what, what society, um, you know, is okay with paying for these surgeries is, is shrinking every year. And so we have to, to balance kind of the needs of the, the patient with what technology is available with, with, with cost. Um, so that's important to think about as well. Um, so, so here's a here's a study. This was out of UCSF where they looked at some long-term radiographic outcomes uh, with an expandable cage, uh, and they compared this to static cages. And this was for for T lift uh, cases, right? Um, so Chang and all, no no relation here, but they they looked at 178 K, uh, consecutive patients who underwent um, uh, static. Uh, 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 so, sorry, 178 patients who underwent T lifts. 148 of them had a static cage versus 62 who had expandable cages. Uh, the mean follow-up was uh, about 43 months, so a little, um, close to four years and for the static cages and a little over two years for the expandable cages. Um, so they found that they had, uh, had superior disc height restoration with the expandable cages, but no real differences in foramenal height between the two groups. Um, and then here you can see on the bottom of the figure an example from the, from the paper where you can see the expansion of the foramenal height um, and reduction of listhesis here using an expandable cage. Uh, and uh, looking at other parameters, they didn't find any differences in the segmental lordosis between groups. And uh, on average, the static cages that were being used were five degrees with an average height of um, just under 10 millimeters. The expandable cages had greater than 10 degrees of lordosis, at least in the cage design, uh, and an average height of 16 millimeters. Um, the one thing that they did find was that their rate of subsidence was uh, significantly higher in the expandable group, about 20% compared to 5%. Um, and then here's an also an example from the paper where they, this expandable cage actually, the expansion mechanism collapsed. 
uh, and the patient had to get a revision. Uh, they had to get an A-lift to, to, to address this issue uh, subsequently. So uh, definitely not what you want to see with expandable cages. So, you know, I think when you look at this paper, part of it, uh, you know, when, when you're looking at new technology, it's not a magic bullet. So you have to use things judiciously uh, when, when you're applying new technology. So for instance, um, you know, when you look at the average height for the expandable cage, 16 millimeters, you know, I would argue that if you're going to use um, an expandable technology, I wouldn't go beyond what you would normally use uh, too much uh, with a static cage. So, um, you know, 16 millimeters on average, I would say that's probably supraphysiologic and might have been a source of a lot of the failures. Uh, and then secondly, I think this is one of the limitations with some of these bullet designs is that when you think about where your cage is sitting, that's a lot of where the trauma that you have to the end plate when you're doing your disc prep is happening. Um, it's along that corridor, that that kind of oblique corridor where you're working towards the middle. You want your cage, your bullet cage to, you know, kind of span the midline. Uh, but that's a lot of where you're doing your paddle shavers, your carets, things like that. Um, it's a weaker part of the bone. You're you're not with it, you're not opposed to the apophyseal ring. And so I, I think part of that is the limitation of the geometry again that we're we're talking about. So, um, so uh, you know, in my practice, we use a expandable banana cage where this sits more anteriorly and it, it's oriented horizontally. And so, uh, we first published about this in in 2018, uh, assessing the radiographic and clinical outcomes for these types of cages. So the cage is able to articulate, but then also expand, uh, and this is done in a minimally basic uh, approach. It can be done open as well. Um, so uh, we looked at 44 patients, one or two level MIST lift, uh, medium follow-up of uh, a year and a half, uh, minimum of one year follow-up just because uh, I tend to get um, CTs on these folks at one year just to assess for arthrodesis. Um, you know, radiographic, our radiographic outcomes, we had an increase of disc height about three millimeters. Uh, more importantly, we were able to increase the segmental uh, lordosis by about five degrees uh, and then increase in overall lordosis about 2.48 degrees. Um, you know, at the time, um, there was a paper that came out of the University of Miami that found that on average for an MIST lift, you were actually kyphosing people uh, a degree or two after MIST lift. So um, this is a significant reversal in terms of um, uh, advantage uh, in your sagittal correction. Uh, clinical outcomes, we were able to decrease the ODI of 15.7 at one year post-op, which is well over the, uh, the minimally clinically important difference for, for ODI. Uh, so the patients were pretty happy. Um, uh, here's another paper by uh, Zach Ray out of uh, WashU. He's he's kind of also uh, a similar uh, a use, uh, kindred spirit, I guess. Uh, he uses the same type of cage uh, where they had a, a longer term study. Um, they had 68 patients, 74 levels. Um, radiographically, they found about a seven millimeter increase in disc height, uh, 2.8 millimeters increase in foraminal height. Uh, their mean increase of segmental lordosis was almost seven degrees, which is pretty astonishing for when you think of an MIST lift. Uh, they did see some of the at 8.1%, but there were no revisions. And then on the graph here, you can see on the right, uh, you can see improvements of uh, you know, the numeric rating scale for pain, for the back pain, as well as the, the westry for, for low back pain as well. So um, pretty significant and durable improvements there. Uh, and then just to kind of provide an example from my own practice. Um, so this was a patient that was referred to me, a uh, 60-year-old 60 year, 60 year female at the time. Um, she had a prior L3 to 5 laminectomy um, three years when, before she presented to see me. She, had, uh, she did well from that surgery. She had mostly leg symptoms and neurogenic claudication at the time. Uh, but then she had new onset of symptoms um, for about a year prior to seeing me. And she complained about pain rating down the right. Uh, where in the left lower extremity and worsening uh, pain in the back. Um, she failed some conservative treatments. And um, you can see here on her MRI, so the, the listhesis that developed at L4-5, this was de novo. Um, and so when you, um, since she was operating on by one of my partners, you could see her older MRI films where, you know, she had uh, just, you know, um, uh, lateral recess stenosis, uh, got a laminectomy, and then this was kind of the sequela of it. So, this is, uh, you know, I would classify this as, as a grade two spinalis thesis. Um, and she had disc collapse at four five as well as five one. And so this was a case where, um, and then here you, uh, you can see the, from the standing films, um, you can see the, the listhesis there, 
Um, five one doesn't look great either. So to Dr. Chapman's point earlier, uh, we include this in the construct where we did L45 and L5S1. And so you can see, you know, where the cage is seated, um, your anterior, you, um, with the geometry from this cage, you can get a fulcrum to increase your segmental lordosis. So, you know, if you couple this with a posterior osteotomy, you could go get uh, quite a bit of correction. Uh, and if you do this over multiple levels, it, it can be a pretty um, powerful tool for, for deformity correction, uh, even without a three column osteotomy. So um, here, here's an example of, of, of that T lift cage in action. So switching gears a little bit, what about lateral applications? Um, so there's a number of options on the market here. Uh, and you can see kind of these early generation where we're still in that peak paradigm uh, where you had a, the, the expansion mechanism was actually made out of titanium, but you still had peak end plates. Um, nowadays, most of the applications you see titanium end plates, and then we're also getting into having 3D printed titanium end plates as well. Um, so these are some of the current offerings that you can see. Um, here, here's, a here's a paper from Dr. Lee. It's a retrospective study looking at uh, expandable lateral cages. And he had 24 uh, one level cages, or say 24 patients, uh, 19 that were one level, five that were two level uh, with two years of follow-up. He used an expandable titanium LF cage. Um, and then he found that uh, radiographically looking at the, the, the outcomes, he had uh, improved lumbar lordosis of six degrees, increased the mean foramenal height of 3.3 millimeters. And he had zero instances of, of subsidence here. And you can see, uh, again, the Oswestry Disability Index um, in the order of months, uh, significant improvements there on average in, in his patients. Um, actually, th this is an interesting paper to go back. Um, uh, I've kind of you know, simplified some of the highlights here, but uh, in his methodology, he actually took uh, measurements in um, the, the three different quadrants or, or three different um, areas within the disc space. He looked posteriorly in the in the sagittal midline and then anteriorly. Uh, so um, it's just interesting to see kind of what, what types of changes that he saw um, in this study, um, if you have time to go back and look at it. And then again, here's an example from my own practice. Um, so this was a 58 year old male who had sudden exacerbation of low back pain after an MVA, uh, left lower extremity pain. Um, most of his symptoms were exacerbated with weight bearing and activity. Um, he had kind of the classic neurogenic claudication where uh, pain was alleviated by leaning forward. Um, and they actually had a positive straight leg raise on his uh, physical exam findings with, um, uh, with radiculopathy. Uh, you look at this MRI, and again, this is something that when you see, you, 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 um, you got to be a little suspicious. This, this may not be your typical DGEN pathology. So this gentleman actually had a spondylolysis at L4, uh, which um, interesting was silent for most of his life until he got into this car accident. So he had no history of back pain or leg pain prior. Um, so, you know, this patient, when you look on the axial, he's got favorable psoas anatomy. The psoas is, is touching the transverse process. So the plexus is pretty far posterior. Uh, so this would be a great case to do um, a, a lateral uh, inner body fusion. So again, uh, grade two listhesis here. Um, you know, with the pelvis, you know, not so much of a uh, an issue with the iliac crest, I think, Nowadays, when you have uh, angled instruments, even if you're doing trans OS for, for this approach, uh, it's perfectly doable, uh, not, not a contraindication. Uh, and this was the final result that we did where, um, you know, we got, this is an 18 millimeter cage um, that we put in. Um, this expands about up to about 15 degrees, uh, 14 millimeter in height. Um, and then we, um, uh, and then we supplemented with uh, fixation posteriorly. And, um, you know, got a uh, pretty decent re uh, reduction of spondylolisthesis. Symptomatically, he did great afterward, uh, uh, and so, which is the most important thing because, you know, a lot of times we look at their radiographic results, but um, it's probably more important to consider clinically how the patient's doing after, after surgery. And then how about other uh, applications uh, like anterior column release? So, uh, you know, with... Uh, with the popularity of the anterior column releases, you have some hyperlordotic options with these adjustable cages. Um, and then interestingly, you, you have cages that go in either parallel or slightly lordotic that will expand up to 30 degrees. Uh, most of these uh, have a plating system um, that allow you to pl place a screw to kind of hold the cage in place once you do the ALL release um, uh, before you flip. And 
Uh, I would argue this gives you a more controlled technique for disrupting the ALL. So if you if you look at kind of the original description, uh, you would basically uh, section the ALL and use a trial uh, sequentially to to rupture the ALL. So instead, what you're able to do with this, uh, um, if you're going to utilize this technique, is you can you can start a little bit an, uh, more anterior to the disc space. You can place your cage. And then you can expand your cage and put the ALL under tension. And then sometimes that actually helps you visualize a little bit better. Uh, and then with the uh, with with the ALL under tension, that gives you you have a little bit of easier time of of, of cutting it because uh, with a um, you know ba basic surgical techniques uh, tension counter tension. Um, once the ligament is taut, it's easier to to cut it. And then you just need to cut it halfway before you expand it fully and then you can get your ACR uh, into your column release. So um, as you, you can see in this example here. Uh, what about expansion in multiple planes? So that's available now as well. So, you know, we've been talking mostly about uh, rest restoration height, but what about uh, your overall footprint? So um, here's a study from this, uh, from uh, Lee Tan out of UCSF, uh, looking at this cage that expands both in height and in width. And this is more of a feasibility study just to see, you know, what's the safety profile uh, of the cage. And, um, you know, overall, you can see uh, increase in segmental lordosis. Uh, you can see the changes in the disc height, uh, improvements in the, the PROs for, for back pain, leg pain, and, and the EQ5D. Uh, and then really there was no instances of implant violation, cage subsidence, or revision surgery uh, with this implant. So, uh, you know, I think that this is a newer offering on the market, and um, you know, I think that our, our partners in industry are, are going to continue to innovate in this space to to address uh, the limitations of geometry with with cages. Um, so switching gears a little bit, so now we'll talk about bioactivity, um, and in particular, that gets into surface technology. So most of the technologies they aim to deliver on the premise that a porous surface will help to promote osseous integration of an inner body device. Uh, so if you look on the histological slides here, so if you look at uh, traditional peak, it's smooth and you get this fibrous uh, layer that forms and then the blue, which is the orange and the blue, you have the bone. So there's really no interface between the bone and the peak. And uh, and then when you look at the example here in the porous peak, you can see a little bit more uh, um, more uh, interplay histologically between the, the bone and, and the surface of, of the um, uh, the surface of the cage. So the, the thought here is that you have early integration. This eliminates the micromotion and this promotes arthrodesis because you need stability to, to promote arthrodesis, right? Uh, and then um, titanium, which, you know, fell out of favor, um, you know, initially, which was, uh, you know, due, it was thought due to the stiffness and the modulus of elasticity um, that titanium was part of the reason why you had subsidence of the cage. But um, when you look at the properties of the metal itself, it promotes osteoconductive activity. And, and I think an example you can see with, you know, arthroplasty where you have, uh, you know, titanium uh, bone interfaces that's are that are common, um, you know that, that's you know part of part of the what you're trying to take advantage biologically. Um, so here are different examples of surface technology on 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 the market. So you have the 3D printed titanium on the left, um, and then you have the plasma spray titanium peak cages there in the middle, and on the right you have the porous peak. So what does the evidence look like? Um, so this is a study from uh, IJSS looking at uh, plasma spray titanium coated uh, peak in implants, um, and this was a retrospective study. And so they did a comparison of the spray to, um, oh, actually, sorry, no, they, they just looked at the, the sprayed implants, and they're looking at the time to fusion. And on average, it's about seven months uh, uh, time to fusion that they, 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 they were able to observe. Uh, and then we're using actually CT images here where you can see this example of this ALIF cage where you have a uh, bone uh, growing through the uh, the window there. Um, so pretty pretty solid fusion. So that, that's a viable technology. Um, and then also looking at uh, 3D printed porous titanium compared to, um, or, or just looking at subsidence using 3D printed porous titanium. So this was uh, from Dr. Uh, Adam Cantor's group out of uh, out of Pittsburgh at the time, and so with this study, um, they did um, 
uh, up to four levels of surgery. Most of them you can see 32 of the cases were, were done one level. Um, about 70% of the time they actually did stand alone. So no, no posterior su uh, supplementation. Um, and then you can see the diff distribution of the, the graft uh, cross-sectional area. Uh, and then they also looked at subsidence as, as one of their core outcomes. So the marquee subsidence grade, the, the grading is basically where you have zero subsidence at zero. Uh, and then one, two, three, you basically have different percentages of loss of your disc height, uh, where uh, a, a, um, grade three would be 75% uh, loss of disc height through the, the spacer. And so you can see um, basically uh, the, the amount of subsidence that they saw was much lower than what had been previously published for, especially for standalone laterals. And so the thought here was that you had an earlier uh, uh, osseous integration in the cage that, that minimized the, the risk of subsidence. Uh, and then here, uh, here's another standalone study looking at lateral lumbar inner body fusions, uh, comparing the 3D printed titanium to the peak cages. And so, <clears throat> Uh, in, in this study, you can see that um, they had more peak cages than titanium, uh, more levels treated. And what they looked at was basically the time to fusion uh, in these cases. And so um, there was an early group and a late group where the early group you had fusion, um, you know, less than a year in the late, or in the late group, it was a little bit later. And if you go to kind of the, toward the bottom, evidence of fusion per level, yes, no. So you can see with the titanium group, um, you had an, about 95% in the early phase compared to 62% in the, um, in the, with the, uh, titanium compared to 62% with the peak, uh, spacers. Uh, and then with a the late group with longer term follow-up, um, you're still seeing a little bit more arthrodesis or higher rate of arthrodesis with a CT, uh, compared to peak. Um, and then you can see on the, um, this is a figure taken from the paper on the left. You can see the integration of the, of the bone. Uh, around the titanium is um, around the 3D printed titanium uh, spacer, which is is pretty striking. And then so, um, and then so finally, here here's the last case uh, uh, example from from my own practice. So uh, here's a 3D printed titanium case example. So here's a 77 year old male. He had a prior L5S1 MIST lift for an isthmic spondylolisthesis. Um, he had an issue with uh, infection, so he had his screws removed as well. Um, looked like he fused there between 5-1 and then developed new onset leg and back pain uh, afterward. And so he had actually developed a slip at 4-5. The, um, uh, the axial images there is actually at L4-5 um, where he was uh, having um, uh, predominantly radicular symptoms from, from the slip there at 4-5. Um, when I pro uh, you know, looking at this MRI and looking at the pre-op x-rays, he actually had quite a bit of... Uh, spondylosis um, above four or five. And so I was worried about stopping my construct just at four or five. Um, so this was a case where we did uh, uh, prone lateral as well as a T-lift, uh, prone lateral from L2 to four, uh, T-lift at four or five and infuse them from L2 to L5. And so here's a, um, the, the result immediately post-op. And I, I think just also, you know, um, you know, looking at this case retrospectively, you know, as far as for what we talked about with cage technology, you can see the differences were of the cages that I, you know, I described to you compared to the traditional bullet cage. Um, you know, it, it's striking the difference in the the, the footprint and and um, and the type of sagittal correction you can get with this, as well as the increased bioactivity. So. Um, you know, I think the good news is that we have better tools to address some of these challenging pathologies that we're seeing um, uh, when we're looking at our, our cage technology. So, um, so in in summary, you know, there's innovation of technical solutions to address cage limitations. So the the limitations of geometry and limitations of biology. Um, the evidence for expandable technology continues to grow, uh, and a lot of the limitations with a lot of these technologies is that it takes time for the evidence to kind of catch up. Uh, and then as surgeons, you know, we're always looking for um, a better tool to help our patients. And a lot of times the evidence is lacking with this. So at least for an expandable space, the technology is continuing to, to expand. Um, and then with the advanced surface technology, um, I think the evidence is in earlier phases, but we're starting to see uh, some positive, uh, some encouraging results uh, in utilizing this technology. So thank you for your attention. Um, be happy to take any questions.
Yeah. Dr. Chang, as always, you're a superb teacher, and we always appreciate you being here at SSF. And uh, again, today's lecture is uh, the same high quality, um, big picture perspective. So thank you. So uh, three uh, quick fire questions. Um, first, biomaterials. You alluded to, but I just wanted to drive that point home. If we look at all the available biomaterials, where does peak stand? Is it just a completely hostile kind of a, a vital thing, or do surface technology changes make it a little bit more hospitable? Is that a credible kind of a approach to overcome the bio inertness? Right. Um, so when I put together this talk, I, I had a hard time finding uh, you know some non biased sources for porous peak. So I think. <laughs> Um, you know, I think the jury is out. I, I think when you look at, you know, what, um, you know, if you look at kind of their basic science, their, their, their histological slides and things like that is encouraging. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think for now I, I would give the nod towards titanium. I mean, you know, you, you put your money where your mouth is. I, I, everything I use is titanium now. So, uh, and I've been happy with the results. And then one thing that I see, and I think we all see that, is uh, where surgical colleagues throw in a cage into a disk space, and it's just jammed in there, and there's no bone in there really that you can tell. There's no larger disk prep. Uh, there's no realignment. So uh, that bothers me a great deal because there's not a credible biologic in-growth capability and a device is put in into an area where it violates Dr. Benzel's fundamental aspects of good cage placement, which is, as you had pointed out, midsection or end ring, apophyseal ring placement with a large enough case or well enough placed cage on bone graft. So um, <clears throat> does the prospect of a better surface technology take away good carpentry and putting, is a leading question I wrote, but <laughs> take away uh, bone graft uh, de deployment and prep. So the, the promise of uh, industry to kind of have a better surface technology that can quote, grow in, does that take away good carpentry and bone graft placement? Sorry for the leading nature of the question. Yeah. No, I, I think, you know, especially uh, for, for the trainees out there, I mean, we do have a lot more technology at our disposal, but it's not a replacement for good surgical technique and, uh, you know, a good understanding of, you know, the biological principles of arthrodesis. Um, it's interesting because I, I've looked at some different 3D printed technologies and the FDA still requires that you have a graft window in an inner body spacer, but in Europe, it's actually not a requirement. So I've actually seen uh, designs of a 3D printed cages that um, you basically pack the graft from the side, but as far as for the interface with the end plate, there's not a, a place for, for the graft to go in. So um, I guess the, the answer is the EU, uh, the EU thinks maybe not <laughs> to, to answer your question. Great. Any other questions? I think we're at the uh, eight hour mark. Thank you for taking the time uh, to come and we enjoyed your commentaries also. And while we have some differences, oh, one second, there's uh, yeah, Dr. Pirzad from Afghanistan, thank you for joining us today. It's so cool to have visitors from around the world with us. So thank you, Dr. Pirzad. We appreciate your interest and faithful participation. Um, I think the principles are the same. That's, again, uh, selecting patients well and uh, deploying the devices thoughtfully and with care. Uh, your cases that you showed are beautiful and, again, show the same principles. Realign the spine as good as you can. and. Uh, especially with the lateral approaches, I do must say I, I do like the large foot, footprint that they have and the end plate uh, fixation that they offer. That's a really big deal. Yeah. So thank you. Thanks for your wisdom. Appreciate you very much. Yeah, thank you. It's been a pleasure.